right, we're getting started. So uh, welcome to this press conference um, on special education issues. Um, we're going to start by uh, calling on Vice President of the CTU, Stacey Davis Gates, to um, to address, uh, you know, to give you kind of folks an overview, and then we will uh, have a couple other speakers as well as some rank and file special special education teachers, uh, and then we'll be opening up for questions and answers from from you, the journalist. So um, go ahead and take it away, Stacy. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us um, today. We're going to lay out some of the um, challenges that our members have been facing um, with respect to offering. Um, our students special education services um, that they so desperately need. Look, we're in the middle of a pandemic. This, um, these times are different. They're trying. They're unlike anything that we've experienced as um, a, 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 a nation, a global community in 100 years. Um, obviously, um, you know, our members went from being in front of a whiteboard, in front of a Zoom camera, uh, virtually overnight. Um, and with that, um, the directives to our special educators um, have been less than what they needed to be. And as a result, students who need the most have been um, deprioritized. Listen, um, the U.S. Department of Education under um, Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos offered zero direction to our state board of education. And by doing that, it gave our local school districts the opportunity to create directives. And what the Chicago Public Schools did um, was not provide us with anything that resembles innovation, anything that resembles more uh, time to provide support to parents and provide instruction to our students. Um, we have been in a situation where the legal department have provided these directives to limit liability, right? And by doing that, they have made case managers, they've made clinicians, they have made educators, um, paralegals, and paper pushers instead of folks who are offering direct instruction to our students. So the lawsuit reflects the need for us to instruct our students. We want to be in a position to innovate. We wanna be in a position to offer support to parents. What we are faced with right now is a massive amount of paperwork. What we are faced with now are parents and students and educators frustrated because they cannot connect on the level that they need to in order to offer our students the services that they need. But this is nothing new with the Chicago Public Schools. This is a school district that is currently under ISBE, Illinois State Board of Education Monitor, for past abuses of special education law. So the failure of the Trump administration to provide Lori Lightfoot's Chicago Public Schools with direction on how to offer some of the most vulnerable students that we have in our, our system Support and protection has led to an imaginable request for paperwork and the lack of innovation and instruction necessary to ensure that our students, their families get the support that our clinicians, that our case managers, that our educators want to so desperately provide to them. Um, I think Jesse is next. Thanks, Stacey. I want to be clear that the Chicago Public Schools and Betsy DeVos, who's head of the Federal Department of Education, have forced us to this point. Um, they forced us with a deficient policy during this pandemic. And frankly, we think it amounts to a clear difference to the needs of special education students at this moment. Our goal, and the goal with this lawsuit, is to get special education students the supports they need to get our members, the teachers, the clinicians, the PSRPs, the supports that they need, and the, the freedom from onerous and impossible to meet administrative requirements um, to, to get the federal and local policymakers to make our jobs doable. It certainly takes more than ingenuity, in, uh, innovation, and grit which is what Betsy DeVos has said that we're gonna be working with. It takes resources and leadership from the federal government 
and we've had none of those. It takes more than putting your head in the sand and passing the bag to the person below you. So the federal government passed the bag to the state, the state passed it to the district, the district passes it to teachers, and as teachers, we're not the ones who are willing to be left holding that bag uh, when we're working ourselves silly, trying to make special education work during the course of a pandemic. So that's really where this lawsuit originated. And uh, what we hope to do is we, we hope to um, force both policy changes and resources into the schools that will allow for the proper education of our students with IEPs. Um, I am gonna note that the Illinois State Board of Education has told school districts that they must bargain with their unions to come to mutual agreement on the terms of remote learning, something which Chicago Public Schools never did. And um, while CPS ignored that, um, that in fact wound up robbing our students of instruction time and supports as workers scrambled uh, to fill in unnecessary and impossible onerous paperwork requirements. So we're gonna let uh, both our financial secretary, Maria Moreno, who is also a clinician, uh, talk, and she's also gonna introduce some rank and file members who've been working specifically under these conditions, um, trying to make remote learning work. So Maria, that's to you. Maria, I think you're on mute, got on mute. Sorry. Um, you know, our, our educators from day one, uh, as Jesse had mentioned, have had to scramble to figure out how to uh, plan for remote, remote learning and then implement it on their own, right? They didn't get the direction at the local level with the school district. Um, and the failure of the federal government to recognize that we are in a global pandemic, we are in uncharted territory and just says, oh, just keep doing everything the way it was when the schools were open. Not realizing that we're gonna need resources and we're gonna need a lot of support so that the, the students receive the services they need and our members can provide it in a way that's sane and makes sense. Um, now, I would also like to introduce uh, our speakers. Um, you know, no one knows better than our frontline workers our teachers, case managers, counselors, and clinicians, what our special education students need and deserve. Uh, we were confronting massive staff shortages before COVID struck, and CPS has used efficient federal policy to make a bad situation worse. Today, we are joined by two of our tireless frontline special education workers, Carolyn Burns, who is a case manager and special education teacher, and Carolina Juarez-Hill, a social worker who are going to say a few words about why CPS and federal policy is unworkable and irresponsible. Uh, and I now give you Carolyn Burns. Go ahead, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Um, as Maria mentioned, uh, I am a special education teacher and a case manager at Bowen High School. And I'm also a member of the CTU SPED committee. Uh, there are three types of case managers in CPS. And uh, we have standalone or full-time CMs, 0.5 or part-time CMs. And we also have case managers who receive a stipend for taking on additional duties during the school day. Case managers who receive a stipend can also teach up to five classes a day while also providing case management services to students with disabilities and their families. There are many challenges for case managers like me during remote learning because CPS has mandated that all case managers schedule meetings with parents to develop a remote learning plan or RLP for all students with disabilities. This has greatly increased the workload for all case managers in the district. I receive a stipend for taking on additional duties of case management at my school, which is a small school with 83 students with disabilities out of a total of 246 students. And this has added an additional 27 hours to my case management slash teaching calendar for RLP meetings with parents and IEP team. It is impossible to complete all remote learning plans before school ends, especially in the cases where case managers have hundreds of students with disabilities to schedule meetings for. CPS has not provided a timeline for remote learning plans or any guidance for how they should be written 
to address the individual needs of students with disabilities. CPS must explain to parents why the full minutes cannot be provided in ROPs during remote learning, just the same as why the full minutes are not provided during extended school year programs for students with disabilities over the summer. The CPS directive to copy and paste to develop ROPs further contributes to the excessive paperwork demand and redundancy with completing over 50,000 ROPs for students with disabilities who have active IEPs or 504 plans, which should only be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We want to serve and support our students, not be forced to neglect them as we struggle to fulfill CPS's burdensome paperwork requirements and the huge caseload so many of our special ed workers confront. And lastly, CPS should include all stakeholders in the decision-making process before poor ideas are rolled out, causing confusion and distress among members. This includes the members of the CTU, SEIU 73, and parent advocates. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and now we'll hear from social worker, Carolina Juarez-Hill. Hi, thank you for uh, joining, having me participate in this uh, press conference. Uh, the reason I feel that this lawsuit was necessary, it, it kind of highlights the additional stress um, and the struggles that CPS has put on us clinicians, special teachers, special ed teachers, and case managers. As a social worker, I am witnessing the trauma that the school closure has placed on our students. Um, the other day, we had a SPED teacher that reached out and said, I'm not getting this student to be engaged in the uh, remote learning. When I was eventually able to reach out to the parent and find out the living conditions of the family, it shifted our priorities. This mandate of having us to do additional paperwork is not allowing us to address the priorities. So with this family, I was able to um, have them qualify for the STLS, the homeless program, where eventually in a couple of days, the family was able to partake in those benefits, uh, obtain the services that they needed, and then the student was more engaged. Um, we are re-traumatizing our students if we are not addressing the priorities of their living conditions. And as we can see from press conferences with the governor, as well as others, daily living conditions changes all the time. It is fluid. So we must address that. And it's not allowing us to do that with our families. And that's just one example. There are multiple examples where when we reach out and find out the reasons why families are not engaged in the remote learning, we find out that. To request of us to do the additional paperwork and meet with parents when their priorities are elsewhere, uh, with health reasons, living conditions, financial reasons, even with the basic needs of getting food for their families. Um, this changes everything and this just adds to re-traumatizing the family. So I really feel that this lawsuit just highlights the uh, struggles that we currently are experiencing with our families and even members ourselves. And then it just kind of reprioritizes where uh, we shouldn't be. We should be prioritizing where our, our students need us and where our families need us. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carolina. Um, we are now going to uh, take questions, and I just want to make it clear who we have available, that besides the folks you've already heard from, we have Tom Gagan, who's the attorney who's uh, filed the lawsuit, who can help answer legal questions if they come up. We also have CTU Field Representative Lisa patera McGrain who works on special education issues, and CT organizer Jim Caviero, who's recently given on leave as a special education teacher, who will help answer questions. And our staffer, Eric Ruder, is gonna uh, call on reporters and read questions as they come in. So Eric, I'm now gonna pass it over to you. Thanks, Jesse. So um, yeah, if you use the hand raising function on Zoom, I can, I see Sarah Karp from WBEZ just has, and I'll call on Sarah next. Uh, so I can call on you that way. You can also place a uh, question in the Q&A panel. So like Tanya Francisco from WGN has, and I will uh, ask, call on Tanya a second after Sarah. So, um, uh, all right, so that's how we'll handle the Q&A. Um, you can, like I said, you can either read, uh, I'll call on you to, to, to state your question, or you can place it in the Q&A or the chat panel. Okay, so um, Sarah. You are on. I see you unmuted, but I can't can't hear you. You there? 
Hmm. Okay, not sure. I'm gonna come back to you, Sarah. Maybe um, you can work out an audio issue that you're having. Uh, I'm gonna now call on Tanya next. You are on, Tanya. Okay, I think it's easier for me to just ask instead of typing. Um, we reached out to Secretary DeVos for a comment about the lawsuit and her press secretary wrote back, quote, this is nothing more than political posturing for a headline. It is sad to see the union making excuses for why they can't educate all students instead of figuring out a way to make it happen. Uh, reaction to that. I mean, what do you expect her to say? I mean, she has abdicated her responsibility to provide guidance and direction in the middle of a pandemic to special education students. Um, she has quintessentially been a failure in her position as the chief of our nation's education department. And so this lawsuit exposes her incompetence. This lawsuit exposes her negligence for our most vulnerable students. So of course, that's what she's going to say. She has zero defense. She has no, um, she has nothing to add to it. I mean, what she should have said is that um, our office, um, we will look at this lawsuit. We will engage with those who are having issues. We will figure out if it has merit. And if it has merit, we'll figure out how to offer our students the best type of education. Look, uh, Chicago Public Schools is no stranger to breaking special education law, which is why these uh, directives have been so onerous and devoid of uh, best practices is because they don't know how to do it. They don't respect the people who do the work and they are, you know, trying to, you know, play a game of covering their behinds because they know that they're still under ISB monitor. Um, this is a situation that doesn't serve the needs of children who need our educators to be in support mode and innovative mode. Okay, before I call on Sarah, is there anyone else who wants to also respond to that question? Okay, uh, then let me go ahead, Sarah, let's see if we've resolved your um, mute issue. Are you able to speak? Okay, well, it looks like she posed her question here in the Q&A panel, so let me just read it. She says, um, she's got a mainly logistical question. If the judge grants an injunction, what will he be stopping? Would he be saying that the remote learning plans don't need to be written or something about what the federal government must or must not do? So if you want to take a stab at answering that, Tom or others, just unmute and go ahead. Tom, you have to unmute. Did that there work? Go. There you go. Uh, the injunction um, that we're seeking uh, is to bar the secretary from enforcing regulations that require the writing of new remote uh, learning plans. And we seek that because on April 26, the secretary had to submit a report to Congress that clarifies all the waivers of existing regulations. She submitted a report that provided very few uh, instances uh, and only one under the IDEA. Uh, the next day, <clears throat> the Chicago Public Schools issued this guidance that requires a drafting of new remote learning plans, new IDEAs effectively from scratch. So they got the signal from uh, the secretary uh, that they have to uh, interpret the regulations to the maximum. Our injunction would clarify that that is not enforceable now uh, during the, until the final judgment in the case. And uh, we have uh, sued the Chicago Board of Education to ensure that they do not force the drafting of new remote learning plans from scratch, new conferences with the parents uh, while the uh, suit is pending. Let me add one other thing. It, it's not just the injunction feature of the lawsuit. The lawsuit also seeks additional resources so that we can do our jobs and educate students. And I think the idea that Betsy DeVos is saying that the teachers and clinicians that are working themselves to the bone to provide education services during a pandemic and dealing with all the problems that we're dealing with, that we're somehow trying to not do our jobs 
when she, when her office, their, their one job is to provide guidance and leadership to the schools to help us get through a pandemic. She's running around issuing micro grants to people who are trying to change K through 12 education and she's not doing the thing that she's supposed to be doing. All right, thank you. Um, I've got a question in the chat box from Kara. Uh, she asks, is this suit premature given that Congress could still decide to issue waivers and that DeVos has no authority now to waive those provisions? Uh, well, the suit is not premature. Uh, as who wants to answer that? I, I can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Bessie DeVos issued a report to Congress under authority given to her under the CARES Act saying that she would not exercise that authority. And that was pursuant to a provision of the CARES Act that required her to report back to Congress by April 26. Um, so she's engaged in what lawyers call final agency action by uh, declining to make waivers. Um, and uh, we are uh, suing to challenge that final agency action, her report back to Congress that she wasn't gonna waive uh, these, the requirements that uh, CPS is interpreting to require brand new um, remote learning plans from scratch. Uh, and that's the reason why the suit is ripe now. You know, of course, during the pendency of the suit, uh, Betsy DeVos and the Department of Education could change their mind about everything. We hope they will, or they may have to come under compliance with an injunction issued by the court. Thank you, Tom. Okay, um, are there other questions? There's an additional question from Sarah Karp in the Q&A. Ah, thank you. Thank you, yes, question from Sarah. Has CPS explained what the point is of remote learning plans if many of them won't even been, be written until after school ends? And at that point, if school goes back in session, they will not be needed. Or is CPS wanting these if remote learning remains in the fall? I think it's a CYA on CPS's part. When Betsy DeVos failed to provide any relief from bureaucratic requirements. It then, the federal government then passed that to the state, which in turn passed it to the districts. And now CPS has then put it down on teachers. And I, I, I think that if they were being honest, every administrator in Chicago Public Schools would say that it's impossible to conduct 70,000 meetings in the last eight weeks of school or six weeks of school but they're insisting on it because it's technically a legal requirement from the Department of Education and that's what our suit seeks to address. It's part of what our suit seeks to address. Eric, uh, just quickly, um, you've got Nader's questions as well, correct? Um, let's see, something here. Actually, I don't think I have them. If you could just text them to me, I can read them out. Uh, okay, I've got Tanya Francisco with another question. You are on, go ahead. Okay, um, two questions. One is just a point of clarification. Uh, throughout the lawsuit, in the beginning, you say roughly 60,000 IEPs and 504s, and then in the end, you say 70,000. I just wanted a clarification of what, what the number is. Is it 60 or 70,000? Is that to me? Sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, we estimate it's approximately uh, 51,000 uh, IEPs. Um, we have a reasonably good count on that. Uh, our count on the 504 plans is, uh, is not as good, but we believe it's uh, over 20,000. So that gets you to 70. Okay, are there other questions? I, 
Um, Eric, can you have one of the educators address Bessie DeVos's um, comment that they don't want to do work? Sure. Yeah, that would be that'd be great. I mean, you know, Betsy DeVos says that that uh, that educators really are just this is just a posturing lawsuit, and too bad it's just covering for the fact that educators aren't really doing the work to educate their students with special needs during this crisis. Is would a Carolina or Carolyn want to take a stab at that? Sure, I could respond to that. Uh, just from my perspective, I, I want to say that we are currently working well beyond the four hours that we were instructed to work with uh, doing remote learning. Um, some of our families are not available until much later in the day. So we are calling and engaging with them throughout the evenings on weekends, uh, just so that we can reach out to them to see what their needs are and what, where they need support. So my priorities are to look at where they need support, if they're being traumatized, how we can minimize that trauma by, by not placing additional expectations for meetings as well as looking at the work. So I wanna say that this is not anything that we're doing for publicity's sake, but just to address the struggles that our families are having, as well as this now taking our priorities and putting it elsewhere where we should be just focusing on our students and our families. Thank you, Carolina. Carolyn, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I'll add to that. Um, in my role, um, every day I'm torn to try to make the decision of whether or not to provide case management services solely for my students and families or to provide direct services to my students in the co-taught classes that I service them as a special educator. So now that we're in remote learning, that has not changed. Actually, that has increased. You know, because not only do I want to do the case management part and the um, teaching part, but now I have to understand all of these new directives that are coming down the pipeline and how to do this new form and that new form and all of that when I really should be in the office hours supporting my students like I'm doing. Thank you, Carolyn. All right, I have a, a few questions from Nader Issa from the Sun-Times. Um, First question is, he says, special education obviously is challenging in a remote setting. Um, but moving past this school year, do you think IEPs should be revisited to see what needs changing since remote learning might continue in the fall? And is it possible to serve those students in this setting under their current IEPs? Would someone like to take a stab at that? Um, I can do that. So I believe that it's, it's important to understand that our IEPs are written for a full day of school. And in order for the remote learning plans to work, we have to revisit the IEP and talk about it in order for us to work with the students in the fall. If in fact we do go back remotely, absolutely we have to have these remote plans in place. We have to have the support needed in order to get them done. We have to have all of the resources that we can possibly get from technological support to support from the, the school system, the home schools, making sure that if children don't have access to technology, that they have access to the paper copies of things. Um, it's important that uh, we understand that the IEPs are addressing the individual students' needs. And that's not just an educational need, it's not just an academic need, we have social emotional needs as well. And that's why it's important that we have these remote plans in place. And that's why our teachers have been trying to work on them. So yes, an answer to the question it is very challenging, but with the resources and the supports in place, absolutely our teachers can do that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, here's a question, another question from Nader. Uh, CPS says that its remote learning guidance does not require any rewriting of IEPs or 504s. So where have you interpreted the guidance to require that? Um, if it's all right, I'll take this one as well and somebody else can jump in after me. Um, the IEPs are a legal document and the way the IEPs are written now, as I said before, it's for a full day program. Our remote learning is a shortened day just as it is during our summer programs for our students who are needy of those. Um, in order for us to write an RLP, a remote learning plan, to meet the shorter school day, 
that means that the IEP, the original legal document, is being altered, is being revised. And in order to have a revision, you have to have a meeting because it can't be done just with one person, two people, any, any person who services that child plus their family or guardian need to be involved in that meeting. So that's where the breakdown is. You have to have a meeting if you're changing an IEP and to write an R RLP, you need to change the IEP minutes and, and areas of service and length of service and duration of service in order to meet a remote learning setting. Thank you, Lisa. Hey, Eric, can we give um, the educators to also offer some response to that? Sure. Carolina or Carolyn, would you also want to say something more about um, that rewriting process? I want to say that part of the times when we are meeting with parents, um, and I'll just give an example of when I had to do an assessment, um, I had to talk to a parent during her lunch hour while she was at work. That is not an ideal setting for me to talk and ask confidential questions to a parent. I don't know what environment she's under. I don't know what's, where she's feeling comfortable in answering these questions. I can't get a reading of where she's at in any way doing this remotely. And so when we have these meetings or we're placing these demands to change the, some IEPs or change, uh, make some changes to the type of service or delivery, um, we're opening ourselves up to not really having the parents fully understand what is happening, what their rights are. These, um, the, we're trying to get these uh, roll out like an assembly line and we are trying to do this as quickly as possible because of the mandate. And I think we're opening ourselves up for some, uh, we're, not, we're violating some rights here with parents um, because I don't know if they're understanding everything that's happening with these remote plans. I don't know if they're comprehending what they're agreeing to because of the speed, because of the demand that was being placed on us to do this. And I just know from my setting, from my perspective, we just can't go ahead and continue to work right with these plans and, uh, and expect these parents to understand what is going on and what they're really agreeing to. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I've had already uh, three RLP meetings uh, in the scheduled IEP meetings that I had for the year. And during those meetings, you know, once I explained what the remote learning plan was, and the parents understood that it was meeting and addressing the goals that already exist in the current IEPs, most parents were like, well, I don't need this. Like, you all are already providing the services to my child. So they are basically telling me, no, they do not want an, a remote learning plan because we are in the Google classrooms with our students, either in the instructional classes or within the uh, co-taught setting. Our speech pathologists are co-teaching with our, our other teachers, our SPED teachers, to provide that one-to-one -one or that group um, work to provide those related services. So we are doing the work. CPS also needs to get a story straight. I mean, I'm, I'm reading from the ODLSS um, remote guidance, which they issued recently. And on the bottom of page four, it talks about uh, the remote learning plan meeting. And it says the case manager will review each student's IEP, including the goals, accommodations, and or services in consultation with the appropriate school-based staff to draft an appropriate remote learning plan. The IEP team will need to send a notice of conference to the parents guardian for the purpose of developing a draft remote learning plan for students with IEPs and 504s. And then and it, and it goes on and it talks about, it talks about the, the requirements for notice of conference. And then it says the remote learning plan meeting can also occur at the same time as the reevaluation or annual meeting and, and goes on and links to a remote learning plan document. So, it, and then it, re, it, I mean, it refers all throughout this document to a remote, remote learning plan meeting. And if CPS in fact is not requiring a remote learning plan meeting, I wish they'd go ahead and put that formally in writing, um, but it's certainly not acceptable to give us one thing in writing with our formal guidance and then tell the press something else as if they're not doing it. I mean, you, you can't have it both ways there. Right, and that I think leads to the last question from Nader, which you know he kind of picks up on this um, Department of Education statement. He says they're calling the lawsuit political posturing and, and that it's meant to avoid helping special ed students. And then he asks, so how do you think this lawsuit will help special education students. So I think he's really asking, you know, what is the relief that you're seeking that will, um, that will actually improve the situation? 
You want me to answer that? Well, uh, let, me, let me just say, let me say briefly, Tom, and then and then you can maybe put a fine point on it. I mean, briefly speaking, we are looking for relief from onerous and unmeetable bureaucratic paperwork requirements that require us to run as many as 70,000 meetings in order to alter documents. What we need to be doing is having contact with our students. And secondly, we're asking for resources to help us um, do the work required to, to um, provide instructional support in contact with, with, with uh, over 100,000 students during a period of, I'm sorry, with over 70,000 students during a period of coronavirus crisis. Thank you. So did you want to add anything, Tom, or anyone else? Just that um, the press release tells you that she's seen uh, the lawsuit. She understands that we're complaining about writing new plans from scratch and having all these conferences for 70,000 students. And her answer is, get to work. You know, that, that's not viable. And it's um, going to interfere with the rights of these children to free and adequate public education because the teachers, clinicians, case managers are gonna be spinning their wheels for an unnecessary bureaucratic objective which has been um, um, insensitively imposed and, and gratuitously imposed um, by bureaucrats instead of giving the services that these children need at a very traumatic moment when um, there's a, 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 a pandemic and, and a movement to remote uh, learning. It's uh, the perfect justification, that press release, for the suit that we have brought. Uh, and Carolina or Carolyn, would you want to add anything further? Okay. Um, um, quickly, I'm wondering if uh, one of our officers or someone wants to qualify um, how this comes on the heels of already grossly inaccurate, um, inadequate um, services and supports, massive short staffing and so forth for um, SPED workers. Lisa? There we go. Sorry. Uh, Chris, you asked, could you ask the question again? I'm sorry. So um, just flesh out how these onerous, you know, paperwork requirements. Um, you know, as a legal dodge for CPS's shortcomings and the Fed's shortcomings come as the entire special ed space is confronting gross staff shortages and a long history of failing to provide services, hence the ISB monitor already. Sure, so as we've known for the past few years, CPS has under Forrest Claypool, it's, it started before him, but it actually came to light under Forrest Claypool, that there were so many um, errors in judgment when it comes to educating the special education students. Um, now what's happening is because we're in this pandemic, instead of you know, keeping common sense, CPS is just adding more and more on to our educators. As, as we've spoken, as Stacy has said and Jesse has said earlier, the teachers started this the day after the schools closed, they jumped on and started remote learning with the IEPs that they had in front of them. Services have been provided. We have gotten no direction from anyone and giving us more paperwork makes it even harder to instruct the students and to give the students what they need socially, emotionally, and academically. We are getting two, three, and four versions of this remote learning plan. We've got, we got one in paper and then schools have gotten three, at least two to three different versions of it. So schools that have worked on it now have to redo it, even though CPS says that they've got it fixed, that it won't have to happen that way. The miscommunication is, is just as bad as the additional paperwork. But again, the legal document is the IEP and adding more paperwork to that IEP takes away from the education of the students. Teachers are using their academic time, their two hours of, of student engagement time in order to get these meetings held and in order to get this paperwork done. 
it's very onerous. It's taking away from their own issues during this pandemic that they need to use their time for their families is now being used for this additional work. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Lisa. Also, I see that from Stephen Miller, there's a, a question just kind of restating what CPS is saying and asking for our reply. So he's saying CPS says the lawsuit is about, quote, avoiding the necessary steps to ensure our most vulnerable students are supported, end quote. And CPS also says that it only wants teachers to make, quote, basic accommodations, not rewrite IEPs. Carolina, can you answer that, please? Sure. Um, CPS is requesting a lot more, and they're, uh, they're assuming with their, some of those questions or comments that we're not doing our jobs. We have gone and done our jobs. We have learned how to do remote learning on our own. We have learned to reach out on our parents, using our own resources. We have been very creative in trying to engage with our families in so many ways. We are doing home visits. Our security guards are doing home visits. We are helping distribute laptops and uh, the technology that's necessary. We are calling Comcast to help them with internet connections. We are doing things that we've never had to do before, and we gladly do it. We are not hesitating. We are not, you know, pulling back on that at all. And I really find it a little insulting to assume that we're not doing it. I find that just um, belittling almost that you are just challenging me to even do more so when I'm not, and I don't need to be thanked. I don't need to be recognized for it. This is my job and I gladly do it. I have no problems doing this. But I really just find it a little insulting that that's the assumptions that they're having and we're complaining to do. And again, the additional paperwork is taking us away from the priorities of our students and our families. If we do these remote plans, we are being robbed of doing our self care, being robbed of doing uh, care for our own families and care for our families, our students from the public schools. We are being infected with this coronavirus. We are being affected by the coronavirus, we are all going to have losses in our families and we have that already going on and it just feels like we're trying to address all these issues and the remote learning plan is just really unjust. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Yeah, can, um, can I yeah, just go ahead, Maria? Yeah, I, I, I just find, yeah, just following, I, I'm just incensed, literally incensed that that the Board of Ed, s since the reign of destruction of Forrest Claypool, who Dr. Jackson was in his administration, and I recall back in 2016, we brought up these issues regarding how these policies were being put up to prevent students from getting the needs that they needed as disabled students with needs by putting up roadblocks from not getting them the services and the paraprofessionals knowing full well that what he did was illegal under the law. And it's the same people who are in administration right now that are blaming educators, blaming us for the delay in services when the board had nothing. We kept asking us, what is your plan for remote learning for our paraprofessionals, for special education, for clinician? And they repeatedly said, oh, we don't have anything. We don't have anything. We don't have anything. Delaying the process. And now they're making a colossal mess of everything by constantly coming out with revised FAQs, giving vague directions, and then giving directions where it puts all the onus on our members to try to figure things out. It is, it is outrageous, and it sounds just like Betsy DeVos, who has the gall that says, teachers, just shut up and get to work when we're the ones that are trying to fix this mess out and making sure that our kids are safe, and if they need the help, they, they get the resources that they need, not the Board of Ed. Now, it's not the Board of Ed making sure the kids have internet and all these devices. It's our members constantly calling and making sure, are you okay? Uh, how, are you getting help when you're infected and sick? We've had families who, who are dying. We have students, families who are dying and are sick, don't have their jobs anymore and are hungry. And the gall of the leadership of the federal government and of the city and of the state abdicating the responsibility is just outrageous. Thank you, Maria. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions in the queue. 
Oh, uh, Stephen Miller asked the question. This is a, just kind of a, some basic facts here. How many special ed teachers and clinicians are there? And yes, you're correct. We're talking about, there are about 70,000 plus seven special ed students with either an IEP or a 504. Um, but the question about how many special ed teachers and clinicians do we have? I don't have that correct number, but I know we're understaffed. I know whatever the whatever number we do have of social workers, psychologists, speech path, all the nurses, we don't have enough. We are constantly looking for employment. I don't know how many are retiring, but whatever the number we do have, the real question is um, how many do we need? How many, how much more do we need to have? And what we need to have is more than what we're given right now. These priorities is just, you know, it's just too much. We can't keep up with the cases. There are about 300 special education vacancies currently. There are about 300, and this is Stacy. Um, there are about 300 special education vacancies currently, if that helps to answer that question. Thank you. Plus massive school nurse shortages. We okay, appreciate so, Is that it, Eric? Yep, yeah, that's it. I was just about to wrap it up as well, saying you know, to say uh, thanks for everyone for attending. Um, I think we got through all the questions and uh, certainly you can stay tuned. We'll, we'll be updating people in the future when there's more to report. Um, so thanks for uh, joining us for this press conference and uh, have a great afternoon.